Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. Well, today we're revisiting my friend, Sean Dawson. Sean is a professional forager. His business, Barking Kettle, sells foraged and preserved foods to fine dining restaurants in Newfoundland, as well as at the farmer's market. Sean is in demand as a leader of foraging, and he has had an eventful year, publishing his first book called A Forager's Dinner. I was actually at the farmer's market when his first batch of books was delivered, and I've used it, so trust me when I tell you, it's a great resource for foraging. In his book, Sean teaches folks how to identify more than 50 edible plants, including trees, weeds, berries, and fruit, and how and when to harvest them sustainably. It really is a must-have book for anybody interested in food security, eating locally, and cooking with the freshest possible ingredients. Also included are recipes featuring locally sourced wild food from more than a dozen of Newfoundland's best-known chefs. Now we're going to end our show by visiting one of these chefs, the talented Matthew Swift, who's the head chef from Terre Restaurant in downtown St. John's. I met up with Sean at Point Seas Guest House in Pooch Cove to learn even more about foraging here in our province. For those of you who've never been to Point Seas Guest House, it's a beautiful home on the cliff in Pooch Cove. Now I've been there before with Sean, so when we got there, we didn't waste any time and we got right into our conversation. Let's check it out. Has that made everything come out sooner, like the weather? Yeah, for sure. Like I said, we're getting the spring, so we had a ton of rain in the spring, and now we're getting a bunch of sun, so everything's just exploding. Like yeah. last year, we didn't have leaves on the tree till the end of June. Right. But now, all, if you see right here, all the crab apple trees are in bloom, mm-hmm. cherry trees, the apple trees are uh, leafing out, the chestnuts full of flowers, the lilac tree is just about to bloom. All the currents are out. It's, it's, yeah, we're actually getting a spring. It's so exciting, man. That's good. Well, I was saying that last time we came out together, it was later on in the season, so things were a lot different. There was, uh, you know, some of the, the greens were more mature. I remember looked at, like, sure. fire, yeah, yeah. fireweed, was it? Yeah. And that was uh, a little past this time, so now we should be able to get a lot of these, like, fresh and at their yeah, peak. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the spring shoots are almost done now. Like I said, we're just, where we're getting the sun now that it's, everything's growing so fast, but there's still so much to eat around. Are there a lot of places that are buying this stuff now? Yeah, last year, man, it was really uh, disheartening for me because the restaurants really, a lot of them stopped buying food. Mm. And I could understand it because it was such a crazy year. Everyone was just doing the takeouts and everything like that. But, man, it's like a, it's like it was two or three years ago. Everyone wants to eat. and Everyone wants to buy all this local wild ingredients. And that means that the local market is, is supporting. So people are going out and eating at the, these restaurants. Well, the other thing is, has happened since we chatted last is your book came out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So tell me about that because that's got to have increased your exposure and, and you know the the sort of value of all the local foods we have. Definitely, and it came at a perfect time. It seems like uh, since COVID, everyone wants to do healthy things. Yeah, like it's really a healthy, uh, healthy movement. So, yeah, people are really getting into foraging. I'm doing these workshops down here too, and the tours and everything. So, I've, I've having people message me saying, "Oh, I read your book and I picked this and I went out and got that." So it's uh, yeah, it's really cool, man. So Richie Perez did all the images. It's amazing. It's on my coffee table. It's a beautiful visual book, but it's got tons of information there. We're going to look at a lot of those plants today, but, you know, what are some of the things that are covered in it? Why would it be so useful for people to have? Because I think it's fantastic. Uh, like I said, there's food all around us in everybody's backyard. Uh, there's probably something to eat. So we're lucky enough to live in Newfoundland. We're just still so much untouched land and and uh, still uh, the air so clean here and everything. So... Yeah, people are wanting to get outside and, and do this. So, yeah, I can't see a, a better a, a time to come out with it. And, and like I said, just instead of going to Costco all the time, yeah. there's food everywhere. I mean, if you want, if you ran out of salad greens right now, <laughs> instead of going to Dominion, which would take X amount of time, you could just get go in your backyard or go in, off the beaten track. Well, your you neighbor. said dandelions, right? For sure. I mean, we were eating dandelions since early in the spring. They're, uh, they're getting pretty bitter now because everything's flowered. But still, man, the lamb's quarter's just coming up. The chickweed's just getting juicy. The garden sorrel's everywhere. There's, uh, yeah, it's salad season. There's so much to eat. Well, run me through some of the stuff we see here before we actually go out and try and find some stuff. We've got right, a whole so table for Yeah, it. like I said, this is uh, me and my friend Karen went out yesterday, and this is just from one day of out harvesting, which is mm. pretty hard to believe. You, uh, Yeah, for people listening, there's an entire picnic table here just full of greens, and I'll probably put a picture on our social media accounts. But you can see this, like, there's just so many different things here yeah so in the back here we got lots of rhubarb 
So I'm growing quite a bit of rhubarb too, but uh, I harvest a lot of it from old homesteads. It's a really hardy plant, so it, it kind of stands the test of time. So um, yep, this is from all homesteads and fields where where uh, where you can find rhubarb patches from years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, this beautiful green here is sorrel. So this one's garden sorrel. We have three types of sorrel here on our island. We got the curly dock, the sheep sorrel, and the garden sorrel. This one would be my favorite. You see how beautiful that is, but. Uh, a really lemony lemony taste really good for making sauces or soups or just as, as a as a bite on your salad with all these well these greens it's so powerful though yeah. i remember we had it last year again it wasn't like at its peak this is really lemony it almost tastes exactly like lemon yeah yeah so you uh, see a little bit we'll the go foraging tours we used to do at the grounds years ago we used to make a lemonless lemonless lemonade mm. so it'd be like a pink lemonade that uh, that looked just like i mean tasted just like lemonade with no lemons Wow. Um, and Newfoundland is pretty hard to get lemon. Mm -hmm. We got here, we got uh, this one is Scotch Lovage. So, this is a wild green that grows on the beach. It smells beautiful. I just use this anywhere I would use mm. parsley. Wow. But uh, you can use it, I use it a lot in pickles and things like that. Mm. Uh, makes really nice butter. That, that recipe is in the book. Uh, we got lots of nettles. Yep. So, uh, Matt, Matt down the loves using these. Some of these are going to the Hungry Heart, too. But uh, I use a lot of nettles here too. We uh, we make soups. We make uh, nettle pesto is one of my favorites. Yes. We uh, the last uh, the first overnight we had this year at the guest house we uh, did a foraging dinner for those guys and we did a sting nettle pasta. So we worked the nettles into the pasta dough and made it completely green. Wow. Made a nettle pesto and uh, and and some parmesan on top. What kind of nuts do you use? Like pine nuts with the pesto? No, no, it's too expensive, man. Yeah, I right. Got the funds for that. Oh yeah. So uh, just pick up any type of nut will work, any or seeds. So yeah. I use sunflower seeds, but pumpkin seeds, anything like that, slivered almonds, any of these cheaper things. Yeah. Toast them in a cast iron, man, dry, and they taste just like pine nuts. Amazing. Yeah. So yeah. Right. That's like the cheapest pesto in the world to make. You oh go, my God. Go man, pick the only thing is the then... cheese, and like yeah. you know, you don't need to need to use uh, parmesan. You can use any cheese really. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so man, mm -hmm. cheap pesto and uh, and and a great one. We won the uh, best cold dish at Savor Food Mancho years ago uh, with the nettle pesto. Wow. Yeah. Um. So we got another beach green here. This one's oyster leaf. This bluish, purplish tinge green, and uh, taste this green. It tastes just like a West Coast oyster. So um, yeah, that's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah, cool, that's, that's eh? unbelievable. Yeah, all the beach greens, man. I, I served some mussels to the guests the other day here at the guest house and uh, just put to all it was was uh, I used some of my pickle barn for my pickled hops, uh, wild hops pickles, and all these beach greens on top, steaming them. It was, it was like the best nut mussels you'd ever eat. That's amazing. It, it, it actually tastes exactly like a raw oyster. Like a, it's, Crazy, it's eh? Without the uh, texture. So if you don't like the textures. Um, right here we got chickweed. This is like one of the best salad greens you can have. Anyone who has a vegetable garden has this. Man, it's so good. It tastes really kind of peppery, but mm. a lot like a spinach. Yeah, it's pretty mild too, so I feel like you could make like a full full plate of that. Oh, you know for what sure, mean? Like man. It's like good a as a garnish salad. or as you're like have it with some of your sorrel for a little bite with it. Yep. Um, got lots of river mint here, which is coming up in the rivers. So here you go, purple stems on it, but this is beauty. Or at this stage, people oh, use it a lot for garnish. Yeah, yeah. And mojitos and all that type of thing. Good for making some cocktails. Yeah, super um, fresh. And, and so that's just, you can just find that around too. It's in the rivers. So rivers. if you're picking this one, you want to make sure the river is moving and not stagnant. Uh, and uh, make sure it's not to, like a around septic or houses or anything like that. So pretty, yeah. pretty, it's like for everything you, if you're getting into foraging, you kind of be mindful of be like, Am I picking? Does it feel right that I'm picking here? Yeah. Am I next to a, a like a col culvert with the septic coming out or whatever? So, yeah, you really just want to. We'll talk with some of those safety in. tips too because I remember even since then I've sent you some pictures. People, friends have been like, "What about this? What about this?" And I'm like, "I know the person to talk to." Yeah, oh, yeah. And you know, because it's yeah. great to do, but you do have to be careful because there's a lot of things that can be harmful. Definitely, with for sure. Yeah, but like nowadays with the like with books like mine coming out and the Newfoundland uh, forging books and the internet, be like, I can't see why anyone would ever eat something they can't positively mm. identify. That's true. When in doubt, do not put it in your mouth. That's a good saying. Yeah, words to live by. We're at Point East Guest House with forager Sean Dawson, author of The Forager's Dinner. He's showing us some of the many foods we can find in our own backyards here in Newfoundland and Labrador and giving us tips on how to do it safely and sustainably. We'll be right back. 
after this break. Welcome back. We're here at Points East Guest House in Pooch Cove with Forager Sean Dawson, author of The Forager's Dinner. He's showing us some of the many foods we can find in our own backyards here in Newfoundland and Labrador and giving us tips on how to do it safely and sustainably. Let's check it out. Uh, so this one's lamb's quarters. You see you got like this mm. powdery, sugary coating on it. Good yeah. way to identify it. But man, this is delicious. Just try a nice big leaf. It's kind of got a nutty taste. And it's actually in the quinoa family. So when it flowers, you can use the this little grain, the seeds, like a quinoa. Wow. That is really nice. really hearty. It's yeah, really yeah. So nice like... as in the salad mix. We sell a lot of the salad mixes at the farmer's market, but uh, yeah. all these things in, in one mix. So you're still going to the farmer's market? That's still yeah. going? Every, every Saturday. Yep. Yep. Well, this one's one of my favorite greens. This is also a beach green. It's called Sandwort. So this one grows where the high tide mark stops, or most of these beach greens grow where high tide mark stops. So you find them on the beaches where the where the water kind of kind of comes up to, and uh, yeah, this one's really really hardy green, uh, almost a little bit sweet. It is. Yeah, really nice. I'm trying to think of what it tastes like. It's it's mild, but it tastes like. Has it got a bit of celery taste to it? I don't know. Yeah, maybe a little bit of celery taste. It's good. Yeah. yeah, it's really good in the mixes. Mm. So with the beach greens, if you're getting into going out picking them, you really just want to be, you don't want to go pick everything you see. You just want to mm. pick a few handfuls from each each plant. So some of these other things we're talking about, like nettles and river mint and dandelions and chickweed, these are all invasive species. So mm -hmm. it's like, man, you can pick your heart's content and everything. But uh, well, the beach greens, you really want to, you want to keep, you want to be excited to find these spots and keep coming back to these spots, right? We talked about this with the mushrooms as well. I mean, yeah. the chanterelles, people go and they destroy them. They don't realize it's an organism that basically has to grow back every year. And if you pick all the mushrooms, you lose all the spores. Exactly, man. Well, mushrooms, you're really, uh, the mushroom you're picking is really the fruiting body. So the mushroom is really underneath. So it's the mycelium, all that mat underneath. Yes. So you pick everything. It's like there's a good chance that mushroom's not going to fruit again. Right. As you said, the spore's not going to come out, or you're out trampling around a whole patch. And yeah, yeah, it's like everything, man. Berries, mushrooms, all these things. You really want to be mindful of how you pick it, and uh, you want to be su sustainable so you can come back and, and harvest it for years and years. Well, it, it, you get the spruce tips here too, right? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, the so spruce tips are new growth on these trees as well. So if you get too many of those, it'll also, you know, for the tree sure, grow. This is the brand new growth from the last year's spruce. So, uh, yeah, if you take everything from a tree, chance are you're going to do shock the tree or do some pretty big damage, right? But, but man, you're in Newfoundland, there's so many spruce. Just, yeah. man, I, we picked all these walking down to the beach the other day, uh, or yesterday. And we just took a, like two or three from every tree. Yeah. And, uh, and man, you get a, a ton. And what was the trick you showed me? The ones that roll versus the ones that are flat? Yeah, yeah. So spruce and fir. Fir are edible too, but they taste more piney. Yeah. So spruce right now, if you smell it, it's more of a citrusy smell than a, than a pine. So you can use these anywhere. You use uh, rosemary or mm. I make uh, olive oils and vinaigrettes. Uh, they're good in sweets too, like spruce tip shortbread cookies. But uh, yeah, so you want to you want to go for the spruce because they're more citrusy. Yeah. But uh, the trick is take last year's needles and uh, from the tree and roll them in your finger. And if they roll, they're spruce. And yeah. if they're flat, they're fir. Cool. Yeah, that's a good trick. But uh, yeah, these man, these make wicked ice creams, the simple syrups, good mm. cocktails. I made a rhubarb and spruce tip pie the other day. First time I ever tried that. Nice. Absolutely amazing. Um, what else do we got here, man? So yeah, that one there that I got you taste is sedum or stone crop. Uh, a lot of people grow this in their flower flower gardens and uh, and not know it's edible, but it's uh, kind of got like a cabbage brassica type of taste. Mm. So uh, the other uh, maybe two or three weeks ago, I made a big batch of kimchi with it. Oh, cool! And uh, the recipe called for this and daikon radish, and uh, and there was lots of. Uh, a wild shepherd's purse up in my vegetable garden which yeah. tastes just like a radish so i just made it with two of those things and um, no i don't have any shepherd's purse here okay yeah, I yeah. Say, it looks like radish right over there oh yeah there, that is from my vegetable garden okay yeah, yes. yeah i might want some radish too but um yeah so i made it with two of those things and man the, on the foraging walks and the and the dinners people said it was the best uh kimchi they've ever had right well yeah. that's yeah and that's it's funny kimchi is a real art form too yeah, man, it's super easy with the foraging, man. It's got me so into fermenting foods. Like, uh, this this creates you to be so much more creative than going to the grocery store. When you go to the grocery store, you get comfortable. You get your peppers, your tomatoes, your onions, your staples, and you stay away from 
everything else but when you're forging you're eating what's in season and it comes so fast you're constantly changing yeah and with me i'm just saying like you know nettles is kind of like spinach so why not make a spanish capita this is like cabbage why not make a kimchi or a sauerkraut right. right you know what i mean so um yeah create guys would be so creative and you're eating all these different types of nutrients in season so you're not just selecting what crops you want to eat you're really all these things are doing different things for the ground to replenish the earth as soon as you uh, rip up a piece of ground then all these things are coming back like the, to try yeah. to turn it back into grass trying to turn it back into forest so man you're eating all these things you're going to be you're going to be a healthy person. Well, that's the other thing, too, is that, you know, number one, there's a diversity of nutrients because there's different things you're eating based on the season. And then number two, um, there has to be more nutrients in things that are growing out in nature as that opposed too, to the right? things that are genetically modified and things like that. We know that a tomato that you grow in your garden is a lot different than what you're going to get in the grocery store. So For these sure. are all yeah. from nature. And it hasn't been sprayed by pesticides and, and you know, mass produced in warehouses and things like that. So the... You know, a lot of people think of these as famine foods, but man, you you get into cooking these and be creative. Like these are much better than anything you get at the grocery store. I had a question about the greens. Do the greens having too many of them or a big? Did your stomach have to get used to For it? Sure, definitely yeah. got to get used to it. Yeah. So with all these wild foods, uh, they you know you can they can uh, flush out pretty good if you're pretty heavy on them. Yeah. But like anything, if you introduce something new to your diet, you just take it take it slowly like uh, my diet's a lot pretty much all wild foods now right. so it's like as soon as you introduce it uh slowly a bit out of time you're yeah and yeah. if you're getting into foraging you're gonna learn different plants so you're yeah. gonna yeah you're gonna get better as you go so yeah it is good start start slow yeah, yeah. and all these greens too they're all full of fiber and everything else that sure. gets our body working so yeah. yeah so take it easy with these but at the same time exactly like, uh, I remember like you, things I've, like not we like japanese now we have picked it all the time but yeah if you ate a, if you made a pie out of that you'd be on the toilet for a week yeah so um, it's good to make like you figure out what to do with it like i make condiments like chutneys and and uh, pickles and things you're only going to have a little bit of on a on a plate or a yeah. charcuterie board or something. Well, that's the other thing too. That's why can, people can go to the farmers market, and meet up with you, ask some questions about what they should put it in, and, and you can give them some guidance on that as well. And then your book, of course, has recipes that people can use. So that's great. Well, do you want to uh, do you want to go for a walk around the property and see what it yeah. looks like yeah, out in man. nature? Sounds good. All right. So this guy here growing in the tall grass is uh, that's the sedum we we're talking about. So that's what I use to make the kimchi. Mm. You see it spreading all over the place here. Mm. Um, big. Looks like a, it almost looks like a flower, hey? Eh? Or but it's like cabbage. You can see how yeah, it looks it's like, like a cabbage, little like... rosette almost. It, it flowers in the, later in the summer and it starts with this pink, pink type of flower that gets real nice uh, reddish burgundy color. Such a pretty plant. Can you use this in a salad too? Oh yeah, for sure. I mm. just uh, I uh, I like cooking it a little bit more, but you can. Uh, Matt from Tier, he he got a recipe in my book with with this stuff. Does he? Yeah. Cool. It's like a lamb and tzatziki hmm. recipe. Uh, so that's the famous, infamous sting nettles. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have uh, gotten acquainted to these as a kid, running through them, and figure a lot of people knew when they think they're uh, poison oak and poison ivy and all this stuff. But you see all these little hairs on it. Yeah. That's uh, each one of those got a little bead of toxin in it. So when that touches your your skin, it gets into your skin and has a little reaction. But uh, yeah, I pick so many of them, I can. Talk, you can do it. Touch them without getting burned, but as soon as it touches the back of my hand or something, it stings. So you boil that? Yep. So yeah, we steamed it. If we're gonna make the the pesto, so we uh, blanch it, just quickly blanch it for a minute, a minute, a minute and a half to get rid of the sting. Or if you want to use it for tea, you could dry it, and it'll get rid of the sting. Fresh tea, you'll have no no discomfort or anything like that. But uh, yeah, quick blanch and, or fry it in a pan. Any any cooking will will take it away. Huh. Yeah, such a such a healthy plant, so tasty. Like I said, like the the pesto is better than any basil pesto you'll ever you'll ever have. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing, and it's, it's everywhere too. For I'm sure. looking at a hill right now. There's just so much of it right here, and yeah. right in front of us, we see a huge sedum plant, and then the singing nettles the rest of the hill. Yeah, really good for arthritis too. Is it? Yeah, so huh. so good, full of iron. It's such a such a good plant. Um, so this is the that's the area down here where the pigs. Yeah, they were, and then we extended them because they ate everything in there. So I just spread, uh, we rocked it out the little pond in there. And I spread uh, clover seed, so it's, uh, so the nettles and and everything wouldn't come back. And then this area here, we'll uh, turn it. You see now, I'm starting to build raised beds and everything around here. Yeah, that's beautiful. I like the live. It looks like you took this wood right to a mill or something, or cut it up. Yeah, the price of lumber is insane now. So like, if you want to do projects like raised beds or anything, it's uh, it's pretty expensive. <laughs> yes. So uh, Elka's friend has a has a personal sa sawmill, 
uh, they they own Brown Rabbit Cabins up in uh, Torres Cove, so he was saving us some of the slabs. Huh. So we're gonna do like some fancying and making all the raised beds out of it. Um, yeah, it looks great. Yeah. I mean, it probably looks like a garden used to look like. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Adds to the charm of yeah, it all. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And we got some uh, volunteers from Stella Circle coming in and helping us out. So uh, they um, build it now, and then I'll help get them to help us with the soil and do the planting. And gonna put a circle raised bed here, a little Stella Circle garden. That's nice. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't look like much now, but it'll be a nice garden. It gets lots of southern exposure. Yeah. It, it can get a bit windy here, so the, the old pig fence we built out of pallets should provide some windbreak. Yeah, right, and that's great. I mean, it's funny you say that. You just pointed out they're made of pallets. I never I never picked up on it. Just yeah. like a nice old fence. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this one here is the one awesome. that I use that tastes like radish. This is Shepherd's Purse. You can really good tell from that the seed pods kind of look like little hearts. Oh yeah. But uh, yeah, just just eat that. Tastes just like a radish. There's flowers and everything. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. A little more mild. It's nice. A little more mild. The spice comes at the end. Yeah. But it's so tasty. Mm. Um, if you come in here, you'll see this is the lamb's quarter that's grown everywhere. That one I got you mm. is a bit nutty. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah. A really good tell. It's got that like powdery, sugary coating. Planting some wild hops here, so oh, yeah. up some wild hops, and I'm trying to grow along the, the fence line here. Nice to grow up in. So, I mean, besides for beer, what else is hops used for? Well, I harvest them when I harvest them, find them in the wild, I use them all for the shoots. Ah, so the shoots are one of my probably the best spring shoot. You fry them in butter, man, they're so so tasty. Huh. They make the best pickles, so that's what I do. I, I make a, a IPA pickle, so it's like a calm tom, half calm tom, half uh, uh, apple cider vinegar. Some juniper berries for pickle and spice, and uh, and the wild hop shoots, man. It's, so it's like beer pickled in beer. That and sounds man, good. It's, it's I'll get you to taste it for you. It's so good. Wow. Anyone who takes them on the tour, like man, that's that's incredible. We're at Points East Guest House with forager Sean Dawson, author of The Forager's Dinner. He's showing us some of the many foods we can find in our own backyards here in Newfoundland and Labrador, and giving us tips on how to do it safely and sustainably. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back. We're here at Points East Guest House in Pooch Cove with forager Sean Dawson, author of The Forager's Dinner. He's showing us some of the many foods we can find in our own backyards here in Newfoundland and Labrador and giving us tips on how to do it safely and sustainably. Let's check it out. Well, it sounds like you're doing a lot of collaboration with local people. You said sell a circle right now. You're helping with that and getting people involved there. You 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 collaborate with restaurants like Tear and you've got Kitty Vitty Beer. Like, why is that an important part of what you do? Local is so important, man. It's it's so important right now. I mean, the food industry is is here is so crazy. Everyone works together. Mm. It's uh, such a collaboration. There's there's uh, pop ups where guest chefs do pop ups everywhere. Mm -hmm. The farmers here work together. I mean, in Newfoundland, man, the, the, yeah, it's just such a local scene. And it's so good to be a part of it. There's so many talented people that are using the that are using the local foods as well, and I think that a lot of us might get stuck into going to a lot of the same places we've been a million times. But there are so many talented people here. Uh, you know, yeah, I, mean, I think man. the food scene here is as good as anywhere in the world, if not better. For huh? sure. I mean, like I said, other places is is very competitive and cutthroat. But here, everyone wants to use the same ingredients. Everyone wants to eat what's grown on the island. Um, yeah, man, it's such a such a good scene here. Yeah, that's cool. I love that. What a healthy healthy movement. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, here, yeah, I planted some of the beet greens I got you to taste. So I just oh, did yeah. those the other day. Are those like, the ones that taste like oysters? Uh, this one tastes like oyster leaf, yeah. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> they're looking a bit sad now because I just planted them. Mm -hmm. It was pretty hot yesterday. But uh, I plant, I took a bunch of sand from the beach and mixed it with some good soil. And this one's a uh, sea rocket one. It's the best, best wild green. It tastes just like a, a wasabi. Really, nice. really spicy. Cool. But uh, yeah, just trying to do a few things. We planted some wild leeks. Uh, they're actually originally from the UK last year, and they just took really well. They're flowering now already. So uh, trying to plant a bunch of things down here that would act as a weed and uh, mm -hmm. things that I'm picking trying to mimic mimic the area so uh so we can teach people on the tour that 
more plants. Are there? So, did you plant a lot of the things that are here on the tour, or were they already here? Um, uh, a lot. Most of it's here, like any of the invasive species. Like yeah. I said, as soon as you rip up a piece of land, you're getting all these mm. edible weeds come back. But a, a lot I am planted, like uh, all these dams and trees on back of the fence here. I yeah. dug all those up from an uh, old homestead I'm picking. Um, the pears I planted last year. Like I said, the wild hops. Uh, yeah. We planted lots of currants and gooseberries last year. So yeah, yeah, we're plant, planting a lot of stuff. That's good. It's quite the spot. It's like a, a, a wonderland of, of edible plants everywhere. So you see all the elderberries coming up here. Yeah. Elka planted those years ago, but they're spreading like wild. But I do find them in a lot of homesteads too. Uh, this is a good one to know because there's actually a red elderberry that grows in central and uh, west coast pretty uh, dominant over, over there. And when you're driving down to Bonavista Highway, when they're ripe, they're everywhere. Right. But they're one that one berry you want to stay away from because they have a toxic seed. So uh, you really want to know the difference in, in the red and black elderberry if you're oh, getting into okay. it. So, yeah, there's a lot of things you really want to know, right? So, oh. like, uh, I noticed that the, the cow parsnip's taken over here, and that's the, kind of like the mini hogweed. So even down by your place, Marine Drive, yeah. all that area, man, there's hogweed everywhere. So, uh, and that's in the wild care family. So I can see how some people would try to think it's Queen Anne lace or something. So, yeah, you really want to be mindful of what you're what you're harvesting, right? Right. I mean, yeah, it's people say elderberry, but then the difference between the red and the red and, and the black, black right? right? Could yeah. be different. It's between being sick and not sick. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why you know ultimately. <laughs> Go down and support you guys at the farmers market and uh, and yeah, get the so exact stuff and yeah, and the check best quality stuff. Our tours or, yeah. Uh, well, that's the thing. That's, <laughs> this is half selfish for me to come on and do this show because I keep on wanting to learn more about it. <laughs> yeah, this one here, the really pretty, beautiful flower. Yeah. That one is uh, uh, dead nettle, so it's not going to sting you like the other nettle we we're talking about. Yeah. Not much of a great smell from, but the, the edible flowers are really nice. Really? Yeah, they're really beautiful, but on any plate, and they're kind of sweet. So I brought some down to Tier there a few mm. weeks ago, and they made a really nice syrup out of it, and tasted so good. Yeah, I get a lot of coffees down there. Yeah. <laughs> There's no wild coffee in Newfoundland, is there? Yeah, man, there is. <laughs> what? Well, uh, I do tell people all the time, the dandelion roots. Oh. So, like, dandelion is my favorite plant, hands down, man. I know I say about every plant, but dandelion, every bit of it's use useful, from the root right to the flower. But the root, when I'm harvesting them, you uh, you uh, put the root in a bucket of water because they're really dirty. Yep. And you uh, let that sit there for a day or two and then uh, take it out and it's really easy to clean all the dirt off. Yep. And then roast them in your oven on a, on a baking sheet on the lowest setting with the door open a little to let the moisture out. Yeah. And your house will smell like coffee. It smells like chicory and coffee. And uh, you do that till they get brittle and they break easily or else they'll have moisture in them. Yeah. And you don't want to put them in a jar and let them get moldy or anything. So yeah. make sure they're, all the moisture's out. And man, just use that as coffee. I mean, there's grind no, it up. Yeah, grind it up. There's no caffeine, but if you're trying to, a lot of people are trying to get off caffeine, but it tastes very similar to coffee. Wow. And uh, made last year, I made a dandelion root uh, latte with oat milk latte, and man, you you man, you no one, you wouldn't say it's not coffee. That's amazing. Yeah, I so, trust you too. <laughs> yeah, man. <for laughs> you got sure. uh, you got a good palate for that being a chef. So uh, these are the spruce tips. So mm. you feel them? They're what I was showing you in the basket, and they're real yeah. rubbery right now. Yeah, yeah. So uh, like I said, they taste more like citrus than pine right now. And uh, yeah, all these little husks on them. But a good trick if you're picking them because you don't want to go home and clean them off is just smack them. And nice. Then they all come off. See all the pollen going. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cars yeah. are covered in pollen right now. Yeah. So this is the best time to have these. Yeah, for sure. They shoot. They're happening super fast, and I see they're getting pretty big. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you, they freeze really well, so if you want to pick a bunch now, like just, man, in 15 minutes you have a, a full year supply. Yeah, right. So, yeah, take them home and freeze them, and then just, and they don't clump together, they freeze individually, so you just take a couple out as you need them. Really good on roasts, or... Yeah, you got lots of recipes for those, too. Yeah, man, they're so versatile. They're good and sweet, sweet, savory. Well, it's so funny, the dandelions being your favorite one, you said the best way to get back at them for invading your lawn is to eat them. Yeah, yeah sure. I made a salad with them one time. I made a, a eggs, uh, like a poached egg on toast type of thing with like a little bit of uh, different greens and stuff like that on it, and I uh, used some uh, dandelion, and it was awesome. Yeah, man. I caught them early before so, they flowered. Yeah, it's so, so good. And when we started eating those, man, like it's like Popeye, man. And when that's the first spring green you have, man, I, I, honestly, I feel stronger after I eat dandelion. <laughs> Deadly. And a lot of Newfoundlanders say that that's what prevented scurvy years ago. 
Oh, well, you're right. You were, you know, your all your root vegetable was done. The root cellars were empty. The first first bit of greens you see in the spring was dandelions. Yeah. And Newfoundlanders would collect them and they'd steam them or blanch them and put them away in their freezers, and eat them fresh. Eat them with chicks dinner. So uh, yeah, that's one thing that Newfoundlanders huh. did, is a, a strong tradition of. Amazing. Yeah. So, well, that's good. All the all of our Canada Games athletes have a leg up when the games come here now. Yeah, Just man. Dandelions. Dandelions. <laughs> But like, man, it just took one generation for us to forget all of this this stuff, man. Yeah. So it's so cool to see people interested in it now. It's coming back. Like I said, there's food all around us, and and we're so hooked on on the grocery store and what Newfoundlander like. So many Newfoundlanders just love Costco, man. It's crazy. I know. That I know. that place makes me give me anxiety just going in there. Well. <laughs> or next to it, it's well, like we get our blueberries from Chile, but yet we've got the best blueberries in the world. Crazy, and, man. And and you could just go out and pick enough to put in your freezer that no one needs to get Chilean blueberries. Well, then the other thing about it too is that there's the activity aspect. You're out by nature. There's so much research on water and how important it is to be around water. Um, you know, so yeah, I can see the I can see the benefit of that and everything, man. From what you're putting in your body to your mental health to, like you said, vitamin D from the sun. Yeah. Like, man, it's an easy answer. It is, and I mean, I think you can see that in people's moods this time of year too. So, I mean, if there's a way you can go out and you can forage healthy foods, you can get activity, you can get out in the sunshine, you can appreciate how beautiful our province is. And I think that maybe that's one thing the pandemic has helped us with is realize how lucky we are to be here. For sure. And and that nature, there's people that are on hiking trails now that I, you know, I'm sure that's their first year hiking, but they're out and out doing it, right? Yeah. Like Elka said, when she started the East Coast Trail, when her and her her, her group started the East Coast Trail, like no Newfoundlanders would be on the trail. And now it's like we finally realize how, what we got right in our backyard. we're downtown. I say I do yeah. Signal Hill all the time, and, and that was one of the things I did when I was rehabbing from my recent injury. Was when I could do Signal Hill, I was like, okay, I'm back now. I'm good, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's downtown. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, right. it's a world class hiking trail yeah. in the town. Yeah. Let alone what we got around here. We're so here. lucky, man. If we yeah. lived in Ontario or somewhere, we have to go quite a distance to get out of the city and enjoy these things. Yeah. And then when you're enjoying them, you're probably on someone's property. Yes. So, man, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And here you can knock somebody's door and be like, hey, listen, can I transplant a couple of your? Uh, trees that you don't want <laughs> yeah man people are pretty good like i do a lot of knocking on doors for apple trees and things like that and mm. and man if uh and if, if people want some a lot of people say yes and then I'll, I'll pick whatever they need at the same time but yeah yeah there's a there's a lot of wasted fruit around and rhubarb and everything like that sean thanks for taking me around man it's good to be back here and come in a different season and see the different things you got and uh now we can take a look at how all these play into the dishes that turn into a food masterpiece Anything you'd like to like to say to people that are looking at maybe getting into foraging? Um, yeah, just uh, no better time to get into it. Uh, start slow. Don't go around picking everything you see and think you can eat it. Um, yeah, make sure what you're picking is uh, you can positively identify it. Um, I always tell people there's the uh, flower craze years ago that everyone wanted to put flowers on their salads. Yeah. And one guy picked a monkshood flower. Right. And he ate that and died. So it's like... You really want to know what you're picking, and uh, it can be so safe and so easy if you uh, if you take it all with with caution. And so, if somebody wants to find your book, where can they find that? Uh, I'm at the farmers market uh, every Saturday from nine to four. So come by, have a chat. Um, you can pick it up there. Uh, see what we got going on in season. Uh, we're doing the foraging tours down here at uh, Elka's Appointees Guest House in Pooch Cove. Yeah. So um, and Boulder Books website too. You can pick up the book there. Nice. Well, I highly recommend that, especially people are going to be staycationing this year and getting out and doing things and, and getting active. Hopefully the summer holds like this. That would be a great way to get out and uh, enjoy the weather. So thanks so much, man. Oh, no sweat, man. Good great, to see you. Great to see you, too. Thanks to Sean for taking me around today for what seems to be becoming an annual foraging tour for us at the show. If you want to learn more, you can find him at the Farmer's Market or get his book through bookstores around town. Now, if you're looking for a fun and interesting experience, I highly recommend taking one of his tours yourself. You can find him on Facebook under Barking Kettle or through Points East Guest House, which is found at pointseast.ca online. When we come back, we'll catch up with Chef Matthew Swift from Terre Restaurant, whose menu features many locally foraged foods. He now calls Newfoundland his home and shares why our province is such an amazing place for creative culinary minds like his. Be sure to stick around, because we'll be right back after this break.
Welcome back. We're talking about all things foraging, and that includes cooking with local ingredients. To find out more, I chatted with Chef Matthew Swift of Terre Restaurant to get the scoop on why he makes local food such an important part of his menu. Let's check it out. Chef Matthew Swift has been working in kitchens in Ontario and Quebec for almost two decades. He's worked alongside some amazing cooks and chefs. And before leaving the mainland, he had the pleasure of heading the kitchen at Joe Beef, which is a beloved Montreal institution. Matthew Swift fell in love with Newfoundland and Labrador on his first trip here in 2017. He was inspired by its people, its food, its produce, its history, and its great landscapes. While he's not from the province, he's fallen in love with it like so many other people that have come here. His restaurant, Terre, is welcoming, approachable, and comfortable, and his menu is creative and features many of the foods that we foraged with Sean. We caught up to talk about his route to being a chef and why he uses local ingredients in his dishes. Let's check it out. Hi, Matthew. Welcome to the show. Hello. Uh, good to be on here. I wanted to chat with you because we went out foraging earlier with Sean Dawson, and I know that you use a lot of the different plants that he forages. So can you tell me a little bit about your path in cooking and how you got to be where you are today? I can. It's not, it's maybe not as interesting as, as it might seem, but uh, I went to cooking school after high school because I didn't have a whole lot of other plans and uh, really enjoyed where that was going and kind of stuck with it. I was in Toronto for a while and then out of the country in the States for a very short stint, not so much work related, back in Montreal for a bit. And uh, surprisingly, I've ended up in Newfoundland. Basically, I uh, was out here for a visit 2017 and kind of fell in love with the place and moved out, I guess, 2019. We've been out here since. Same thing happened to me. I came to Newfoundland, I fell in love with it, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life here. Uh, the restaurant that you are the head chef at is called Tear, and you feature a lot of local foods in your recipes from people like Sean. Why is that? I guess that's it, it's sort of the cliche answer and, and a little bit cheesy, but that's you know why you get into cooking is sort of to reflect where you are in the world and what you what you like, I guess, you know, as I got into it, what was most interesting to me. And I think a lot of people is, you know, working with the season and the environment around you and here that's different than anywhere else I've lived. Even the wild plants that grow have sort of a different flavor here than they do in Quebec. And so as you play off of all of those things, it, it makes it more interesting and means that someone comes to visit and tries something. It, it, it is more interesting because it is something that's unique to here or reflects where we are or what I like or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it adds a lot to the foods. What are some of your favorite local forage foods that you add to your dishes? I, I really like alder. It's not something I used much elsewhere before, even though it's always kind of around and actually I just got a dog and I've named him alder. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like alder and it, it just, it changes in terms of favorite as the season goes on in the, in the spring, you know, it's, Anything green that comes up is very exciting. Dandelions and this stone crop comes out and all of the like crunchy young greens. And then as the summer goes on, you know, we get into everything else, beach greens and hopefully soon mushrooms and then berries and it, it just kind of takes off. But I'm a lot of it is really I'm still learning because it's a it's a different place than anywhere else in Canada. I've lived before and the seasons are different and some plants flourish here and others don't. And so it's it's really been a lot of a relationship with with Sean and, and guys like him and just sort of showing up with, I have this, you can do something with it. And, <laughs> and, and I, I don't always know the times I would expect things are not the same as they'd be in Montreal or in Toronto or anywhere else. So it's, it's, it's a constant. Right. And there are so many different foods when we were going around foraging, he could literally walk two feet, find something different. And we could, we could go for hours and I think he would still find new stuff. You know, if somebody was thinking about incorporating some of these plants into the foods that they're cooking, would you have any tips for them? I think really it's, it's just a, a matter of practice. And I think, again, having Sean here is great because you can go see him at the farmer's market and he's really enthusiastic and really great at teaching people or talking to people about what they can do with all the stuff he brings in. So 
if you don't have time to, to get out and find everything yourself, or you're not confident that you're going to pick the right thing or whatever, you have a place to start and some things to try. And then you can get some guidebooks of your own and go out and there's, there's lots of open space. And really, I think more than anything, it's, it's try things. I mean, do your homework, make sure you're not eating anything that's, that's toxic, make sure the things that need to be cooked more get cooked more, but kind of you play off of things that you already know and like, you know, like a lot of the different greens have different flavors than what you'd grow for a lettuce or something in the garden, but there's still something that you eat and you sort of do have a reference point for how you might cook it if it was something else and start with what you're familiar with. And if you like something, think about how to incorporate it and use it instead of something else that you would have imported. And then from there, you know, see where it goes. Exactly. Well, yeah, I've found some amazing greens and shoots that I found when we were out foraging uh, things like sorrel that tastes a lot like lemon. I couldn't believe it. And you could, you could definitely be creative with things like that as well. Are there any cookbooks or places people can go to start for that? Really any guidebook is a pretty good, pretty good start. I know Sean put out a very good one for, for Newfoundland specifically. I would encourage more spend the time learning, learning what to pick and what, what you, what you like and what you can pick responsibly around you and what tastes good and what's good for you. Mm -hmm. And then for me, I prefer to work more around working it into things that, that I, where I would already use something else. And it's just neat and more interesting to use a wild ingredient, you know, like, you know, lamb's quarters or lamb's quarters work really well in place of spinach and they're supposed to be better for you in so many ways. And I don't know about it, all the health claims around all of it, but it does add another layer and is a, is a taste that's specific to where you picked that. And that's cool. And, and that's true because, I mean, there are health benefits. All, it's all natural and it's green and it's, it's organic. Can we quantify it? Probably not, but that's okay too. Um, one of the things I love about your restaurants, I go down there all the time, is your food is very creative. It's full of flavors. It's really interesting food. A lot of people have a very similar diet day after day after day after day. How would you encourage people to sort of spice that up to add a bit of creativity to it? What does it offer or add to food when, when you make it a little bit different? I think that honestly, you can get into health benefits of that too. I think there are a couple studies I've read in terms of the way that you digest and the nutrition you get out of food that you enjoy versus something that you don't. So there's, there's a little bit more than a utility to it. And I like going to restaurants. I like eating. I like cooking. And so it's in my mind, I'm like, well, that's, that's just good for you. You should do things you enjoy. But in terms of, of how to spice it up and be more creative, it's the more you try things, the more reference points you have. So maybe you don't like everything the first time, or maybe you don't like something at all, mm-hmm. but at least you can say what it is you don't like and why, and think about, what you'd like instead. And really the more you try, the more, you know, and the more you're able to think laterally and make other things and makes it so that when you're out picking herbs, you can think of where that fits into something to make something you already make better or to just change entirely the flavor of something you're doing. That's awesome. Well, yeah. And I think that's it. It's just experience. It's trying new things, being a bit adventurous and we're there. Uh, Any last words you'd have to people when it comes to this episode on, you know, getting out foraging, being creative with cooking before we close off? Um, No, really, really just do it. Do your homework. Make sure you're not eating anything that's going to, going to cause you problems, but just try things. Make sure you're not over harvesting anything. And yeah. Well, they can come down and test out your cooking at Terre. And I look forward to coming down and seeing you. Thanks for taking the time to join us today, Matthew. Thank you. And hopefully see you soon. Thank you to my guests, Sean Dawson and Matthew Swift for joining me today. There are so many reasons we're lucky to live in our province and the foods that surround us are just one of them. Combine that with outdoors, oceanside walks and sharing food with friends and family, then you can see why I think that foraging and cooking are so good for our health. It's amazing to think that there are foods all around us that we haven't tried, so I encourage you to learn more if you're interested. Now, always remember to get the right guidebooks and advice when foraging, but thanks to people like our guests today, it's getting easier and safer to try your hand at foraging every day. Thanks for joining me today. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of the Wellness and Healthy Lifestyle Show on your VOCM.